Uh, all right, up next uh, we have Dr. Vikram Deshpande from Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, he will be speaking on the topic of precursor lesions um, that may also have implications in uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Again, hopefully uh, some work that will point us towards identifying patients at risk. I wanted to thank the organizers for the invitation. I must say this is the first time I'm here and it is extremely, as a pathologist who spends, most of us spend our life behind a microscope, to hear patient stories is, is amazing for us because we rarely see patients. We, we spend most of our life on, behind a microscope in, uh, with a slide and uh, it was extremely moving to hear these patient stories. So, I wanted to thank the organizers, but I also wanted to specifically thank Nabil, because Nabil, Nabil and I go back a long way, almost a decade now, and he dragged me from the pancreas up the biliary tree into the liver, which is why I'm standing here in front of you today. Am I doing this right, or what did I do? There we go. So here's the outline uh, that I, I'm going to use. I'm going to talk a little bit about how a pathologist makes a diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma, and then ask this very pointed question, does what I see under the microscope inform about the biology of cholangiocarcinoma? And we'll meander a little bit uh, between those two but I promise you we'll get to precursor lesions and cholangiocarcinomas at the very end. So how does a pathologist make a diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma? This is very different from how your oncologist or how your surgeon makes a diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma. We make this diagnosis based on what we see under the microscope. And I'll let you into a little secret. We pathologists have these secret societies. We don't tell the oncologists and surgeons what we do. And the secret is this, that pathologists generally cannot tell the difference under the microscope in most cases between a cholangiocarcinoma and a metastatic adenocarcinoma. Metastatic adenocarcinomas to the liver being far more common than primary cholangiocarcinomas. And I'm going to show you two images. The one on the left is a cholangiocarcinoma, and the one on the right is a lung adenocarcinoma. And most pathologists will tell you there really isn't that much of a difference. And that perhaps explains why we have so many of these tumors of unknown origin. And primarily is driven, I think in part at least driven by pathologists who cannot definitively tell on a H&E slide between a cholangiocarcinoma and a metastatic adenocarcinoma. So in an attempt to address this conundrum, we turned to the TCGA a few years ago. At this point, the TCGA data was fairly mature. And what we found was that the number one discriminator between a tumor of hepatic origin, and I'm highlighting cholangiocarcinomas and hepatocellular carcinomas, and every other tumor that was looked at by the TCGA was albumin. This is a stain for albumin. This is a cholangiocarcinoma, extremely poorly differentiated. And what you'll notice, this is of course an inside to hybridization stain. We're looking, we're looking at RNA. These red dots indicate the presence of albumin. And what we found over the year or two that we did this study is that virtually every tumor that arises in the liver is positive for albumin, be it an intrahepatic cholangio or a hepatocellular carcinoma. And any tumor outside the liver is generally negative, including most perihilar and almost all bile duct carcinomas. Now you may well ask, how does this help me? Pathologists can tell the difference between an intrahepatic cholangio and a hepatocellular carcinoma. So in the hands of a pathologist, this stain has a sensitivity and specificity for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma of greater than 95%. So we use this stain currently, and it's extremely helpful, particularly when you have a tumor of unknown origin, 
And this stain will help you pinpoint that tumor of unknown origin as a cholangiocarcinoma. So we're going to shift tracks and talk a little bit about histology, how does it inform biology, and I'm going to use a recent study that we did with AGIOS, the AG120 trial. It's an IDH inhibitor in cholangiocarcinomas that have an IDH mutation. You're going to hear a lot more about this this afternoon. So if I'm going to talk about Histology, I'm going to have to tell you what do cholangiocarcinomas look like under the microscope. This, this is a cholangiocarcinoma. And what I'm going to do, bear with me for a minute, I'm going to trace, do you see these little white spaces, these are little tubules? I'm going to trace them, right? So I'm just tracing the lumens. Right? I'm just following those white spaces between the glands. Right, so this, it's creating a pattern, and that is the pattern that it's created. I've just traced the lumens of the tubules. Now, doesn't that look <laughs> like a staghorn? And in fact, it looks virtually identical if I turn it around, upside down. <laughs> Isn't that virtually identical? This is the so-called cholangiola pattern that pathologists have been talking about for some time now. So cholangiocarcinomas, of course, come in multiple flavors under the microscope. Here's another. These are little donuts. They form little tubules. This is the so-called tubular pattern of cholangiocarcinoma. Bear with me, because this does have relevance when we come to the AG120 trial. This is, again, a cholangiocarcinoma. And now what you're seeing is solid nests of cells, right, just packed in these rounded oval aggregates. This is the so-called nested pattern. Here's a pattern that was referred to earlier this morning. This is the so-called bile duct pattern. And this is very characteristic under the microscope because it's, it's characterized by the presence of mucin. It's this blue stuff. If you follow that arrow at the very end, you'll see that blue stuff in the cytoplasm. That's mucin. And there's also that blue stuff in the lumen of that gland. That is mucin. And that is very typical of this bile duct pattern. And finally, the so-called undifferentiated pattern, where we see nothing else. We just see solid sheets of cells, right? just a layer of cells. So why is all this of any relevance? It turns out, and we and others have identified this, that that cholangiola pattern, remember those antler horns that I showed you? That pattern is associated with improved survival. So patients with that pattern do better than other patients. And at least in our data, it seems to hold out on a multivariate setting as well. But there's another reason, and perhaps a more important reason, to start recognizing these histologic patterns. And this is the AG120 trial. This is a IDH1 inhibitor. This is an AGIO-sponsored trial. And there was some correlative science that I was lucky enough to get involved with. You're going to hear a lot more about this trial later on this afternoon. Ben from Agios is going to talk extensively about this. There are also two posters on this trial later on this evening. But I'm going to give you the 10,000-mile-high the view of this trial, specifically as it pertains to histology. So very simply, I know that I apologize for the number of words on this slide, but very simply, we had the opportunity, me and a pathologist from, from Memorial, had the opportunity to independently look at pre-treatment biopsies and matched post-treatment biopsies, right? So we had two time points. One is pre-treatment and one is post-treatment. Some patients, not all, some patients had this very unique change in the morphology from an undifferentiated phenotype where we just saw sheets of cells to antler horns. You see them? So these are little branching antler horns. So this appeared that there appeared to be some level of differentiation, if you will, on treatment. A proportion of patients showed this phenotype. There's a couple of other things that we have known for some time now. Tumors that are predominantly cholangiola have been referred to as 
cholangiocellular carcinomas, particularly in the Asian liter literature. And we have known that this class of tumors, interestingly enough, even though it's bile duct, it shows increased expression of hepatocyte-related genes. So we've known this for some time, and this has been validated in multiple studies. There's also very interesting work that came out of Nabil's lab that showed that progenitor hepatic cells can differentiate into both hepatocytes and cholangiocytes. So they're relatively plastic with that, in that regard. But more importantly, in this context, 2-HG, 2-HG that's produced by IDH mutant cells can drive the cells away from hepatocyte differentiation to cholangiocytes, right? And this happens through inhibition of HNF4-alpha, which is a master transcriptional regulator of hepatocyte differentiation. Just one more piece of information, and this is from our own data. And that suggests that IDH mutant tumors are underrepresented in tumors that show this antler horn-like configuration and overrepresented in every other morphologic class. What I'm trying to, the story I'm trying to get at, and this is the hypothesis that we, some of us have come up with, is that w perhaps, and you'll hear a lot more about this this afternoon, perhaps what IDH inhibitors are doing is it's driving these tumors to differentiate into the cholangiola pathway. This differentiation is associated with increased hepatocellular gene expression, and potentially this might serve as an explanation of why some patients are doing well on this trial. But this is purely a hypothesis at this point, but supported by multiple lines of data. So the final part of the study is we're going to talk a little bit about classifying cholangiocarcinomas and how that fits into precursor lesions. Now, I find this location-based classification, high, hepatic, perihilar, and, and bile duct classification somewhat confusing because very frequently, as pathologists, even when we have an entire resection specimen, we find it hard to pinpoint the epicenter and therefore classify these cases. We now know a lot more about the histology of these cholangiocarcinomas that we did not know 10 years ago. We know a lot more about the genetics of these, class of, of these tumors. And perhaps time has come for us to put the two together, histology and genetics, of course, with a, with a particular emphasis on genetics, to come up with a new sort of classification going, trying to get away from this location-based classification. And I'm going to touch upon this, and I'm going to begin by starting here. Now, I got this from C Bioportal. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but they have a genomic information for most studies. I think they stopped somewhere at 2017. So these are, this is data from four large studies. These are exome sequencing efforts of cholangiocarcinomas. Right off the bat, you'll see some patterns emerging. There's one group which has a large number of cases with SMAD4 and KRAS mutations and a few others. Let's call that the bile duct type. There's another group that does not have those mutations but instead has an overrepresentation of IDH1 and 2 mutations and what's not shown here is FGFR2 translocations. Let's call that the hepatic type. Bear with me a minute. If you look at that first group, the bile duct type, most of those are fluke-related, and you've heard a lot about this in, the, in this morning session. But the advantage of the TCGA database is they actually had histology that was freely available for everyone to look at. And there's actually a, a green rectangle there. That's a TCGA case. And you can, when you go down and look at the histology of this, it does look like a bile duct type carcinoma histologically. And what I'm trying to get at is that there, is, there are histologic correlates to these genetic signatures. And what a lot of us have been now talking about is a broad classification that looks somewhat like this. A bile duct type of cholangiocarcinoma and a hepatic type of cholangiocarcinoma. Now, bile duct type of of, of cholangiocarcinomas are predominantly extrahepatic, 
But if you look at the Asian lit literature, almost half of these cases are also intrahepatic. So you have a bile duct type of carcinoma in the liver, and it's half and half. Not so in the North American literature. The hepatic type is, has several other subgroups as well. Now the bile duct, genetically, look, the mutational profile essentially looks like pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, while the hepatic type is predominantly intrahepatic, but a good proportion of them are also perihilar in location. And the more common genetic mutations are all targetable IDH1 and FGFR2 translocations. So hold that in your mind, because I'm going to come back to this classification after I've talked about precursor lesions. So broadly, there are four precursor lesions for cholangiocarcinomas. The first is what is referred to as a von Meyenberg complex. Now, I don't know whether you can see those. Those black arrows indicate those little white spots. These are multiple von Meyenberg complexes. This particular patient actually had a, a relatively small cholangiocarcinoma, and we know that there's an association between multiple von Meyenberg complexes and cholangiocarcinomas. And histologically, those von Meyenberg complexes, again, look like those antler horn-like configurations. So this is precursor lesion number one. Precursor lesion number two is bile duct adenomas. These invariably have BRAF mutations. So the hypothesis is that many of the BRAF mutated cholangiocarcinomas are derived from bile duct adenomas. And it's very characteristically show these rounded tubular profiles. Now, one of the problems with these cholangiocarcinomas arising from these two lesions mm -hmm. is that the cholangiocarcinoma replaces this precursor lesion. So as pathologists, we seldom get to catch them in the act, so to speak. But here's one we did catch in the act. So this was a bile duct adenoma. That area under that square is a rectangle is a bile duct adenoma that's progressing to cholangiocarcinoma. So this is precursor lesion number two. Precursor lesion number three is the so-called villain or biliary intraepithelial neoplasia. Now we borrowed extensively from the pancreatic literature. It is analogous to panin, which is pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia. And we, we recognize three grades, grade one, grade two, grade three. Grade one has only mild atypia, grade two has moderate atypia, and grade three has severe atypia that looks like in situ carcinoma. And the hypothesis is that this is the direction in which things move, and eventually you get an invasive tumor although no one has ever proven that there is indeed progression to cancer along this pathway. And finally, perhaps the least common of the precursor lesion is an intraductal papillary neoplasm of the bile duct, and those two arrows indicate this large bile duct, and there's the precursor lesion. That reddish oval structure is the precursor lesion, which is the intraductal papillary neoplasm of the bile duct. And on your right, you see this large bile duct with this papillary proliferation. And some of these eventually progress to invasive carcinoma. So what I find fascinating is that if you look within this class of bile duct type cancers, if you look hard enough, you'll invariably find bilin. In fact, you will not find bilin with a hepatic type of cholangiocarcinoma. So it's almost mutually exclusive. While rare, it's extremely rare to find this, but there have been well-documented examples of bile duct adenomas and one bile duct complexes progressing to the hepatic type of cholangiocarcinoma. So broadly, I think of cholangiocarcinoma, this is a classification that we've been talking about for some time, moving away from a location-based classification to more of a histogenetic-based classification as has been done in so many other organs. So this is my conclusion slide. I, I think, uh, I hope I sort of brought that message through to you guys that the diagnosis as far as pathology goes is a significant challenge uh, in terms of identifying cholangiocarcinomas. But we certainly have some new tools. We, at least we, we use the inside to hybridization stain for albumin on an everyday basis now. It's quite clear, I think, now that cholangiocarcinomas is not a monolith. There are several distinct histologic types, I'm a pathologist, so I'm gonna emphasize the histologic types, but clearly other genetic types. And I think these histologic and genetic differences have significant implications as we go ahead in, on these clinical trials that are coming on quick and fast. With that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thanks again for the invitation.